Well, it is a real privilege. And Jonathan, thank you for inviting us. And any chance I have to open God's word and to talk about his truth, uh, I'd love to do that. But especially when someone invites me to talk about God's heart for our world. And so I, I want to begin as we think about Jonah. We're going to look at the book of Jonah today. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Jonah. It'd be helpful to have that open if you have your Bibles with you. And Take a look at that. The nice thing about Jonah is it's a postcard. It's just a little note. The entire book of Jonah is right there on my Bible. Just on those two pages, the, all four chapters, the whole book of Jonah is right there. And if you're going to hear someone's story, and when you meet someone for the first time, you ask them questions, you get to know them, you want to know who it is you're hearing from, whose story it is you're hearing. So let me tell you a little bit about, about this, this uh, prophet Jonah. And, and to understand him, you have to understand his, his context, his world. And in the world that Jonah lived in, in ancient Israel, there was a nation called Assyria. And the best way I could describe Assyria in terms of how the people of Israel saw them is they were like this dark, giant storm cloud. And this storm cloud of Assyria would just kind of blow into a region or into an area and kind of hover over them and rain down destruction. They, they were a violent people. They were a destructive people. When the Assyrians came in, to your part of the world. They didn't come in to make friends. They didn't come in to, to have, have tea and, 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 and visit and chat. They came in to destroy. And when the Assyrians, when the cloud of their fury moved from where they had gone, in most cases, you would not know that anyone had lived there. They would at times so devastate a city that they, they, that they would crush the houses and the buildings down to dust. And they would at times leave their calling card and their calling card was a pile of human skulls. This is the Assyrians. This is the world that Jonah lived in. And so there was a fear of these people. And, and, and when they came toward your neighborhood, it was never good news. You have to understand this to understand Jonah's story. To understand his story, you have to know that Jonah was a product of his religious culture. So he hated the Assyrians. And his hate for them was deeper than we can imagine. You say, well, well what, wait, Jonah was a prophet of God. Why would he hate the Assyrians? Because everyone in Israel feared and hated the Assyrians. It was just, it was in their blood. It was in their lungs. It was the way they saw the Assyrians. If I said to you, if you were born in New Zealand and raised in New Zealand and you breathed the air of New Zealand and you were invited to go to a rugby match and it was the all blacks against, against the wallabies, and you said, I'm going to walk into the area where all the all-black fans are, and I'm going to say, I'm a New, Zealand, New Zealander. Go Wallabies. Yes, I'm for the Wallabies. You would have a problem, wouldn't you? Now, they might not beat you up. They, they might beat you up. Depends on what part of the stadium you went into, right? But you would not be warmly received. Now, now take, take a New, Zealand, New Zealander's you know, love of the all-blacks and, and their... What's the word toward the wallabies? Just uh, uh, their, their lack of love, we'll say. Um, and and take, take those feelings and that intensity and multiply it by about a thousand. And you start to feel the heart of a person of Israel towards the Assyrians. And so to understand Jonah's story, you have to also understand that this prophet of Israel who lived in this culture with the Assyrians lingering and hovering around different nations and sort of slowly overcoming the world, God calls Jonah to go to that nation, to those people, to their capital in Nineveh, and to bring one simple message, repent, turn your hearts from your evil and from your evil ways. And Jonah knows what that means. If he calls them to repent, and if they repent, God will show them grace. And Jonah does not want them to experience the grace of God. Because they are an evil, wicked nation. And in his mind and in his heart, they deserve judgment. So God says, Jonah, I want you to go. I want you to bring this message. And, and so you have to also understand something about Jonah. He had this idea, once God told him to do this, that if he turned around and ran far enough in the other direction, maybe he could get away from God. Have you ever learned you can't get away from God? <laughs> Wherever you go, he's there before you. 
If you turn around and look back, he's following you. And he's all around you. But he thought he could run from God. And you have to also understand something about Jonah. He was scrappy. He was tough. He was hard-headed. He knew what he thought was right. And he disagreed with God on this call. And so Jonah and God bumped heads. And all the way through the book of Jonah, you see it happening. There's a point where Jonah finally does what God says, but that's only because God was so powerful that God was able to push him forward. But it wasn't like he said, I get it, I'm excited, let's go see the Assyrians. When he finally obeyed, he only did it because God was strong enough to drive him to his knees. He was tough, he was resistant. This is Jonah, whose story we read in the Word of God. And so I want to tell you the story of Jonah. I can tell you this whole four-chapter story in just a couple of minutes, but to understand the lessons about, about God's love for the lost, God's love for the broken, God's call on us to love those who are different than us. To get that, we have to hear the story. So if you have your Bibles, you can follow along. If you don't, it won't be on the screen. I want you just to listen and hear the story. Starting in Jonah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. He's running from God. We do that sometimes. We think we can get away and he tries that. Well, as he's running away, a massive storm hits the ship. You can read it. You can read, the, you can read the whole book of Jonah this afternoon in about 10 minutes or 12 minutes. I encourage you to do that. But the storm comes, a storm by the hand of the Lord. They figure out kind of through a whole process that you can read about that the that, that storm is there because Jonah is running from the Lord because he tells them, I'm running away from the Lord. And he says, well, the only way you can stop the storm is throw me, in, throw me in the ocean. Jonah would rather die than go to Nineveh and help these people. And bring a message that would cause their hearts to potentially repent. And so they throw him overboard. And verse 17 of chapter 1, we read, Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And I encourage you to read it today. He prays this prayer. If you get stuck in the belly of a fish for three days, you got some time on your hands. And he prays to God. And then verse 10. And the Lord commanded the fish, great verse from the Bible. You don't get this on T-shirts and on banners in the church, but it's a great line. It says, the Lord commanded the fish, and the fish vomited Jonah on dry land. And you see that fish just, blah, he's back on the dry land. Verse 1 of chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Now watch how things change now in Jonah's attitude. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. He didn't want to. He wasn't excited. But at this point, he did what God said. And he went to Nineveh. Look at verse 5 of chapter 3. The Ninevites believed God. Jonah comes. He preaches. He calls them to repentance. They believed God. A fast was proclaimed. And all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. They repented. The exact thing Jonah didn't want to see happen, happened. And they repented. Now look at verse 10 of chapter 3. When God saw that they, what they did and how they, listen to this, turned from their evil ways, God relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. God didn't bring judgment. The judgment that they deserved. And one last verse. Chapter 4, verse 1. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. There's our prophet. There's his story. Oh God, would you speak to us by your word? Lord, your word is truth from beginning to end. Your word is powerful. And God, if we'll listen to it, if we'll open our, our minds to understand, our ears to really hear what you're saying, our hearts to be transformed, our lives to be changed. Your word can do by your Holy Spirit what it always does when people's hearts are open. 
you can transform us. So we pray that you will do that for the sake of this community, for the sake of the world, and, oh God, for the sake of our hearts and lives. Speak to your church. Your people are listening. And everyone said? Amen. Well, let's think about what God is teaching us here. What I want to do, and if you're a note taker, you can write down, I want to just share three simple lessons with you. Three simple lessons from Jonah's journey that I, I believe will speak to our hearts. Here's lesson number one. God is more merciful and loving than we are. And he seeks those who are different. He seeks those who are wandering. He seeks those who we see outside of the reaches of his grace. God is more merciful and loving than we are. In Jonah 3.10, we read these words. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. God's God's heart, and I don't know how this all works in God's sovereignty. I believe God is sovereign over all the universe, but as, as they repented, God made a decision to not bring judgment upon them. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, and read a, a little bit beyond that. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. Jonah knew their history. He knew their behavior. He knew their destructive patterns. He, he, he knew their murderous rage. The whole world knew it at that time. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. God's grace seemed too big to Jonah. And he became angry. And listen to this. Now you want to get a window into the prophet's heart. Listen to this. So Jonah prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. So now, Lord, take my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. I would rather be dead than see these people receive grace. When you think of Jonah, don't think about the sweet prophet. <laughs> The tender-hearted prophet, man, this is, a, this is a tough guy who's struggling with the grace of God. He's struggling with the goodness of God. Now understand, Jonah's not struggling with the grace of God towards him or towards his people. He's struggling with the grace of God towards them, those people. Jonah has forgotten the greatness of the grace that has saved him. And we forget sometimes. We forget sometimes that God loves the others. God loves the broken. God loves the different. God loves the outcast and the forgotten. And I want to encourage you as a congregation. Would you, would you even today say, oh God, would you give me a heart like the heart of Jesus that seeks out the lost, that seeks out the broken, that seeks out the hurting, that, that cares about those who are different, those who I say, God, I, I know your grace is enough for me, but is your grace enough for them? And the answer is always yes, if the grace of God was big enough for the Ninevites. It's big enough for the people you encounter day in and day out, even the 30% who say, I am hostile and antagonistic to Christianity. God still loves them. Do you believe that? He does. That's the heart of God. And will you become the kind of church that opens your arms and your doors and your hearts to those who are different? Every Sunday morning in the church I serve, I serve I'm, I'm, I'm a local church pastor. I preach and teach uh, probably 50 weekends of the year. Most of them at my church, and if I'm not there, I'm preaching somewhere like this. And, 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 and I love the church, but in the church I serve, we have, we have an 8.30 service, and then we have a 10 o'clock service, and then we have an 11.30 service. And between the services, I sit on the edge of the stage. It's much like this, John. I just sit right along here, and I talk and pray with people. And one day, a woman came walking up who was very different than most of the people in our church. She lived on the streets. She was in a relationship with a man that she was with. She wasn't married to, but she was in this relationship, and they, they, they lived together. They lived in kind of a broken-down trailer, and where I live, you have, to move that, you have to move your trailer every about 500 meters every three days, and then they won't give you a ticket, so they just kind of like Bedouin wandering people kind of would just roll their trailer to one place, park it, roll it, and they lived in a community of people who kind of lived homeless but with some shelter. And she had gone through a very difficult time. Someone she cared about had treated her very badly, and she was angry, and she was hurt. She was not a Christian. She was religious, 
If you could see like the, the, a fireplace you know, in, in her heart with a mantle, on the mantle was every religion and every god she could think of, and she would just grab onto any religious thing, so she had this kind of, kind of this syncretistic, pluralistic, religious hodgepodge of whatever she could get a hold of. And, she, and so she came to church to see if maybe she could find out about Jesus and put Jesus on the shelf with all her other gods. And so she came up to talk, talk to me. She came up to pray with me. And so she told me what she was angry about, what she was hurting about. And as she told me with, with volume and with passion and with anger, she used the F word nine times in her prayer request. Now, most of the people in my church don't use that language like that in their prayer request. She did. I am so angry. And she just vented her anger and she vented her frustration. And after she'd shared all of her hurt and all of her struggles, I said to her, her name is Katajinka. And I said, Katajinka, I would be honored if I could pray for you. And so she grabbed my hands and I held her hands and I, I sat and I prayed with this, this young woman. Brilliant mind. Foul mouth living on the streets, angry and hurting. And when I finished praying for her in the name of Jesus, she looked at me and she, she, it, it was about two years before she became a follower of Jesus. She's still part of our church. I prayed with her two or three weeks ago. Uh, she came up with a concern and something she's walking through right now. Now she's growing as a disciple and growing in faith. She actually uh, rents a small room in a place and she has a job in third shift. Late, late at night, she works at the gas station. But her life, God's bringing her life together. But, but we prayed together and after we prayed, she looked at me and she said, it just, she said it almost like a threat. She said, she said, I like this church. I'm coming back and I'm bringing my friends. <laughs> and she has been for about four and a half years now. She brings her friends who live on the street. She went to the store and bought a bunch of blue tarps so that when her friends who still live on the streets, when there's rain, she goes and sets up shelters for them. She does in the name of Jesus. But when she came to our church, she was very different and very angry, and very hurting. It took almost two years for her to come to a place where she knew Jesus and started the sanctification process. But you know what happened in those two years? She started coming to all the women's Bible studies and any other, she was at church three, four, five days a week, coming to Bible studies. She wasn't a Christian. She still had all these other gods and until she could throw those down and kind of clear off the shelf and put Jesus there alone. She wasn't ready to become a Christian. So she would walk around town, living on the streets, with a foul mouth and an angry spirit, and she'd say, hey, I go to Shoreline Church. That's my church. Do you want people like that walking around town saying, I go to Green Lane Church, those are my people. That's my, they don't even know Jesus yet, right? Do you want those people? Because you're going to get them if you love them well. And some people will say, oh no, God's grace isn't big enough for them. Not sinners like that. It's big enough for sinners like me, but not sinners like them. His grace is always enough. God loves sinful rebels. Second, second thought. Second point, God loves sinful rebels like the Assyrians and like Jonah. And this is important. If we read the book of Jonah and we see the grace of God overcoming and overwhelming for the Assyrians and we miss the, the obvious point that the same God who's showing grace to the Assyrians is also showing grace to Jonah. Because in this story, who's the ones who repent and soften their hearts? The Assyrians. And who's the one whose heart stays hard through the whole story? Jonah. Jonah. You see, God's grace is big enough for sinners like the Assyrians, and God's grace is big enough for sinners like Jonah. Look at Jonah 3, 6 to 9. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any pe do not people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. It's time to fast. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. The king of Nineveh, the king of the Assyrians, says, could it be that this God, whose fury is burning against our sin, could relent and love us and show us grace? And that's exactly what they experienced. Let me ask you a couple questions. How could God love a violent people like the Assyrians? How could God love people like that? How could God love a stubborn, 
hard-hearted man like Jonah. How could God love an apathetic, angry 15-year-old kid that I was? Grew up in a non-Christian home. I cared nothing about God. And I cared nothing about the people around me. I was a self-centered, rotten young kid whose heart seemed so hard. And yet Jesus reached out to me. And he called me his own. At 15 years old, out of an atheistic home, he called me his child. And he extended the grace of heaven through Jesus Christ. And within two hours of becoming a follower of Jesus, God said, you will preach my word. You'll spend the rest of your life telling people about Jesus. I was called to ministry before I ever really held a Bible in my hands. How could God love someone like that? And how could God love someone, can I say it, like you? Like us human beings who can be so petty, petty and so self-centered and so gossipy and so perverse in our minds and our hearts. How could God love any person? Only grace. And when we understand that, we become a people that every one of these communities up here on these boards, we become a people that, that the people in those communities, even if they're hostile to the Christian faith, are drawn to the light of the grace of Jesus Christ. Do you understand that God's grace is big enough for the Assyrians, it's big enough for Jonah, it's big enough for me, and it's big enough to you, for you. And then, a third major lesson from these minor prophets. Repentance leads to amazing grace and staggering mercy. When people repent, when people turn, and we know on our side of the cross of Jesus Christ, repentance is coming to the cross and acknowledging that the God of heaven, who for no humanly understandable reason reached out to us in our brokenness and our rebellion and our sin. The God of heaven sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who bore the cross, who took our sins, who took our shame, who took our judgment, who took our punishment, all deserved. And God in human flesh took it all on himself. And he conquered sin and he conquered hell and he conquered death and he died and he rose again the third day. Is this good news? Is this good news? Someone say, woo! Yeah. yeah, okay, don't be afraid. Yeah, praise God, this is the good news. And because he's done that, we are set free. And we've come to understand amazing grace. Look at Jonah 3.10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. And then chapter 4, verse 11. God says, and should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? Jonah's, Jonah's still debating, God, why would you do this? Jonah's still struggling with the grace of God. And God says, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left? Some scholars would say that what that probably means is children. Children that are still trying to figure out right from left. And also many animals. God's trying to, God's trying to, to deliberate and talk with Jonah and explain to Jonah, can you understand why I love these people, why I want them to repent? Even in the Old Testament, there needed to be repentance. In the New Testament, we come to the cross and we receive Jesus. But God says, do you understand the greatness of my grace? If you're a note taker, I want you to write down three words. And some of you, some of you take notes in your mind and that's absolutely fine. Some of you like to write things down, but write these three words down. Justice, mercy, and grace. Justice, mercy, and grace. And you see a little definition up there. Justice is getting what we deserve. Justice is getting what we deserve. In many cases, it's punishment when we get caught. If you have a police officer pull you over, and there's not nearly as many police here as there are in the States. And you still drive, you should drive over. If you have a, in the States, if you have a policeman pull you over, and you look at your speedometer, and you've, you're going way too fast, most people don't say to that police officer, give me justice. I was driving Way too fast, please give me a fine, lock me up. You know, I should be in trouble for this. We don't want justice. What we want is the second thing, mercy. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. When we deserve just punishment, mercy is not giving us what we deserve. But grace, grace is getting the good things that we don't deserve. I want you to imagine that Sherry and I land back in California where we're from. We're going to be flying back this Tuesday back home again. And, and we drive to our home. And while we've been gone, 
we find out that a family has broken into our home. And they've moved into our home. And they've kind of taken squatter's rights. They, 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 they've moved their family in. And it turns out they're impoverished and they're poor and they've moved in and they've made their, themselves very at home in our house. The, the front door's been kicked in, the lock is broken, and there they are living in our home. Now, now suppose we get home and we, we confront these people and they say, we're so sorry, we, we, we're sorry, we, we, we're just poor, we have children and we're struggling and there was nobody here, the home was empty and we watched for a couple days and there was no one there, so we moved in. And, and at that moment, if you go back to those three words, you know, justice... Justice would be giving them what they deserve. They should be in trouble for this. They should fix the broken lock. They should move out of our house. They should, they should receive justice for that. Mercy would be saying to them, listen, okay, I saw you, you've made a mess. You've broken some things, but if you just pack up and move on, we won't call the police or anything. That'd be merciful. No trouble for that. But grace, this would be grace. We see that you're in need. We see that you feel very at home here, and you're sorry, you're, you're desperate, but you're sorry for what you've done, and so here's the keys to our house. It's your house now. We'll move out to make space for you and your family. As a matter of fact, we'll, we saw the front doors broken and kicked in. We'll hire someone to have them fix that, and we'll pay for that for you. Oh, as a matter of fact, for the next 10 years, we'll cover all your utility bills and make sure that, that the, the mortgage is paid. Here's the keys. Enjoy the house. That's grace. That makes no sense. That makes no sense. It, it's that heart of God. It makes no sense for the God of the universe to say to the Assyrians, I will offer you grace if you will repent. It makes no sense for God to send Jesus Christ to this world to die for us and to rise again and to offer us what Jesus offers us through his death on the cross and through his resurrection is so much better than a house and keys and a warm place to live. He offers us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. That's what Jesus offers us. That's grace. The beauty of Jesus is the justice for our sins is satisfied when he paid the price on the cross and he took our punishment. The justice is fulfilled. He gives us mercy in that we do not get the punishment we deserve, but he gives us grace. He lavishes us with his goodness. That's the heart of the God we gather to worship here today. And if you know that God, and if you know the greatness of his grace, you start to realize that you don't deserve it, that it is still amazing grace, and that that same God wants to offer it to Assyrians today and to angry prophets today and to hard-hearted high school kids today and to people like you and me today. God still offers his grace. So I want to just share a couple of words with you and I don't see a clock, I don't know, but I'm good. Another hour? <laughs> Five minutes? What's, what's the right time? Tell me. I'm looking, there's, okay, perfect. Um, I want to finish uh, in the next five minutes by asking this question. What would the prophet say to you? After Jonah went through all of this and experienced all of this, if he could sit down and teach us what he learned through his own journey, if you could just sit and have a cup of coffee with the prophet Jonah, what might he say to you? What, did he, what lessons might he pass on to us today that he learned in encountering this God of amazing grace, this God of those who are different and distant? What would the prophet say to you? Here's one thing I believe he would say. He would say, God knows your sin and rebel heart, and he still loves you. I think Jonah would say, God knows your sin, all of it. The sins you have hidden from your wife, the sins you have hidden from your husband, the sins you have hidden from your children, the, your, your, the sins you have hidden from your parents, the sins you have hidden from your boss, the sins you have hidden from yourself. He knows them all. And Jonah would say, this is the God who knows the greatness of our sins, and he still wants to have us experience grace if we will turn around and come back to him. Jonah watched it. He saw God's love towards the Assyrians, and he saw God's love toward himself. In Romans 5, 6, we read these words. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died, listen to this, for the, what's it say? Ungodly. What does it say? God, Christ died for who? The ungodly. Say that with me. The ungodly. We think he died for good Christian people. But we weren't always good Christian people. 
And some here probably still are not yet good Christian people. But he died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though you know, for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the good news of the gospel. It's good news to Christians to remember that God loved us that way. And it's good news for you if you're here sitting in this room today and you've not yet come to the cross and received Jesus and you're saying to yourself, I, I might become a Christian someday, but I gotta pull my life together. I gotta straighten myself up. I gotta kind of clean some things up before I can kind of present myself to God. Please don't wait to pull your life together before you come and say, Jesus, I need you. Because you can't pull yourself together good enough. And you don't need to. While we are sinners, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. God's love reached us in our sin. God reached me before I re re really understood what it meant to walk with Jesus, follow him, discipleship. I just came to the point where I said, okay, God, if you could forgive my sins, and if Jesus wants to take my life and use me, I will follow him the best I can. And God just swept him by his spirit and took my life. He wants to do the same with you. What would the prophet say to you? A second thing I believe that, that Jonah would say is you know those people you think are beyond the grace of God? Guess what? He still loves them and wants to use you to reach them. Those people you look at and you say, they, they would never want to know Jesus. Not only does God want to reach them, but he might be calling you. And I won't read the whole passage, but I love, the, I love the story of Saul who became Paul in the New Testament. This, Saul was this highly religious, um, anti-Christian, militant man who was destroying churches, executing Christians, persecuting the church. And God broke in and broke through. And he called this heart, you know, Saul who later said, I'm the worst of sinners and Jesus loved me. And, and you know, Saul saw himself as an Assyrian of his own day. I was a wicked sinner. I was killing Christians. I was doing all kinds of terrible things. And Jesus reached out and showed his love to me. But God calls on Ananias to go and to reach out to this, this new believer, this person that God had, had struck down and raised up. And Saul's becoming Paul. And, and Ananias, he's called, God says, go and meet this man. And Ananias says, I've heard about him. He's violent. He's dangerous. He's persecuting the church. And God said, go and reach out to him. And I love it when Ananias comes to him. He says, brother Saul. He calls him brother. He's been invited into the family. He's come to Jesus. He's now a, this hater of the church, this militant murderer of Christians. is called brother by another Christian. That's the heart of Jesus. What would the prophet say to you if you could sit and have a conversation? He'd say, don't run from God. It only hurts you and the people around you. Jonah tried running from God. It didn't go very well. And if you read the story, and again, you can read it in 10 or 15 minutes today, the whole, all four chapters. When Jonah is, is running from God and the storm comes, the sailors on the ship have all their cargo, all their investments, and the boat's starting to sink. So they start throwing everything over to lighten the load. All of their cargo, all of their supplies are thrown in the water. And when Jonah tells them, this is because of me, I'm running from God. They keep fighting to bring it to shore. They, don't, they, don't, they only throw him overboard when he says to them, the only way the storm's going to stop is if you throw me overboard. And I think he wanted to die. I think he would have rather died than reach out to those wicked Assyrians. And God said, you're not getting off so easy. You're going. We're going on a mission trip here. Do, do you understand that when, when you run from God, we, we tell ourselves when we're running from God, it only hurts me, but it hurts every person around us. Husbands, men, you get involved with another person, another woman besides your wife, emotionally or physically, and you tell yourself, it's just, she'll never know and it won't affect anybody. It affects everybody. And it always comes out. It always comes out. Young people who say, oh, I'm doing this and that, my parents don't know. It's my life, my business. It affects your family. It affects your future. We think, we do things, and we think we can just run away, and we think we can just do our own thing. And Jonah discovered that everyone was on that boat with him. They almost died, and they all lost potentially their life's savings because of Jonah's stupid choice. 
So Christians, can I give you a word? If you love Jesus and you know him, but right now in some area of your life, you are rebelling and running from God and you're telling yourself, it only affects me, I'm telling you right now, it doesn't just affect you. It is affecting every person around you. And if it blows up and becomes public, it'll affect even more people. Christians need to keep repenting. We need to keep turning back and saying, I gotta stop running from God and run back into the arms of Jesus and his arms are always open and his grace is always enough. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, and you say, you know what, I'm, I'm just, I came to church here today because someone invited me, or maybe you've been watching and listening, and you're saying, but I'm still kind of doing my own thing and going my own way. I want to challenge you, let this be the day that you say, I stop running. I'm going to stop running from God. And the minute you turn around and say, what's it look like to turn to God? He's right there with his arms open. Because God's grace is enough for radically wicked Assyrians and for hard-hearted tough, stubborn, graceless prophets and for angry, bitter, atheistic 15-year-olds and for you and for every single person in every one of these communities that you represent. His grace is enough and he sends you like he sent Jonah. Don't fight the call. Lord Jesus, thank you for the greatness of your love. Thank you that while we were still sinners, Christ, you died for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you love us with such a, a powerful, massive love that because of what you did on the cross, all justice was satisfied because you paid the price for our sins. Mercy was extended. We do not get what our sins deserve. And oh God, grace upon grace upon grace upon grace has been lavished on us. And even as the Apostle Paul says, we have received every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. God, you've been so good to us. And oh Lord, for those who are still saying or wondering, could this be the time? Would God love me? Could I come with all my sin and all my brokenness and come to the cross and say, Jesus, I turn from my sin and I turn from my life and I turn to you. I receive your grace and I confess my sin. Would you know today that if you cry out to God, he is waiting. God knows how to forgive those who turn to him. It's what he loves to do. If that's your heart today, I want to challenge you to, to come forward after the service and talk with pa Pastor Jonathan or, or talk with me or my wife Sherry or any of the elders here, any of the pastors here, you know, with Nathan, Nathan, your new youth pastor. If you, see him, just, if you want to just say, how do I take that step and follow Jesus? We would love to pray with you. Let's continue to worship this God of grace, this God of goodness.